Welcome. Hey, it's great to be back again. Uh, we are in Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to point out before I get started that I forgot to write chapter 4 on the slides of our presentation. So just keep that in mind all the way through when it says Galatians. We are in chapter 4. But before we jump into this, I want to just take you to uh, one of our parks. I will tell you this is one of my favorite pictures that Sherry has taken. Uh, this is an old building, part of a business in uh, the parks at Rock City, uh, the park itself. And it's just off to the east there when you pull in. And we took a walk through here. And what is just so amazing, you can see the, uh, it was in a magnificent structure. And all I can tell you is that just the perspective, the details, it's just so peaceful there. And what a remarkable piece of history. Uh, what a place to have a business out there, which is so beautiful. Thank you, Sherry. Appreciate you taking us there. Um, someday I'm going to have that printed, and, and uh, I'd just love to have that one hanging on the wall someday. I hope you enjoyed it. So Galatians 4, the Sons and Daughters of God, Part 2. We spent some time last week talking about faith. Faith being an affirmative response, a yes to God, a yes to Jesus, a yes to the Holy Spirit. That faith is always exercised as affirming we want to be in harmony with the will of God. Faith is not a complicated thing. And we are saved by faith alone. I make that really clear right up front in this conversation. Now I have friends who tell me, that their obedience counts, it matters. They're still my friends, but there's nowhere in Scripture that supports that. Uh, I have friends who tell me that they already have righteousness in them and that God meets their righteousness, so it's partly their faith, or excuse me, their righteousness, and then, you know, God makes up the rest. I do my best and God makes up the rest, which is, again, not a true story of the gospel. It is a co-shared gospel where you are partly your own redeemer. Because if you have that much righteousness in you, maybe God doesn't have to come down as far for some people as he does others. I don't know how you figure that one out. But, but it's just not true. So if you believe you're saved by doing the Ten Commandments, uh, you have some things to learn in Galatians, especially chapter 3 from last week. And chapter 4, uh, we have just simply prayed that God will bless this presentation and that it may speak deeply into your heart, strengthening your relationship with him. Uh, that is my hope for you. I also want to share with you this picture that is a uh, water lily bud that is just under another big leaf on the pond, and it's just very slowly opening. I just loved, again, the colors and the detail, and that little flower just is going to burst out. It's going to be about five, six inches across. It's going to be a gorgeous thing. And Sherry just happened to be there when it was in bud. So, again, thanking you, Sherry, for what you bring to us. So important. So Galatians 4, starting with verse 1. Paul writes, Now I say, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ from a slave, although he's the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the date set by the fathers. In other words, until the child is of age, he or she is under guardianship. No different from the slave. Now, this is a really remarkable illustration I want you to pay careful attention to because we're going to peel back the layers on these verses and they're going to speak to the truth of our humanity, the truth of our nature. So keep in mind, as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ from a slave, although he's the owner of everything. Verse 3. So also, while we were children were held in bondage 
under the elemental things of the world. Now, Paul is using some really remarkable language. So let me simplify it for you. The elemental things of the world are simply the forces in this world that attract our attention, distract us from reality, and are not from God. It's just that simple. Don't make more out of it than what it is. So then what does that tell us about the children that were held under bondage by all the things that distract us in the world? All the temptations, all the lusts, all the things in this world. Can't wait now to get to verse 4, but we got some things to talk about. As children held in bondage, Paul is referring to the description of bondage given in Isaiah. Here's what the children represent in bondage. For this is a rebellious people, false sons, sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord. The elemental things of the world are what they follow rather than the instructions of the Lord. Not complicated. I want you to walk through a series of verses. I want you just to listen to what they say. We're contrasting the children who are not in Christ. Who are we in Christ? So listen to some of these passages and how they talk about the tension of the elemental things of the world. So let's start with 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. That's 1 John 3, 2. Let's go to John 1, 12. But as many as received him, that's those who said yes by faith, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, even those who believe in his name. I want you to notice how faith puts you into a relationship called a child of God, not a child under bondage of elemental things. Faith connects you directly to the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 4, Paul talks about our life before, but listen carefully how he does that. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, the elemental things, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, the elemental things. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest, in this case, the rest of the world. But you see, if you're in Christ, you see the contrast, the difference there. Verse 4, Galatians 4. But when, now this is one of my favorite parts, but when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Notice Romans 5. This is so beautiful, so profound. Now keep in mind, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law. So Romans 5 says this. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. Verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. That is, God's unconditional agape love demonstrated towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Maybe 
this will speak to you. I cannot tell you how many people I've met who have told me, well, as soon as I can get rid of this habit, as soon as I can change this in my life, then maybe, maybe I'll accept Christ. Maybe I'll go to church. Maybe I'll, and they, they have a whole list of things. They're, they're doing things for God, right? The, the do list. But notice verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. In other words, he didn't wait for you to start doing good stuff to die for you, to accept you, to approve you. He waited until we were at our worst. And then he chose to die on our behalf. Isn't that a profound and amazing truth? When we talk about religion, you know, some people make religion about telling others how bad they are, or telling people how good they are, and, and they're missing the point. We have nothing to brag about. We are humbled by this verse because he didn't wait for you to get your life together. He did it when you were at your worst. That means we're free to come by faith any time. Such a profound truth. Born under the law. The term under the law means under the penalty of death. That's what it means. Christ was born under the law, under its penalty. But when the fullness of time came, reading the verse again to you, God sent forth his son born of a woman. You see, born of a woman, Christ was necessarily born as E.T. E.J. Wagner should say, not E.T. Wagner, born of a woman, Christ was necessarily born under the law. For such is the condition of all mankind. If I could help you understand this simple truth, I would say it maybe this way. Do you fully understand that Christ was born under the law the same as you? He was born in the same condition of the entire human race. Point being this, that there is not one thing in your life or the life of your family and your friends that Christ has not fully seen and heard and experienced in living as a man born of a woman. Born in our condition. He knows. He understands. He has experienced and he is compassionate towards you nonetheless. That's profound. Isaiah 53, 4. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Do you understand what it means to be a son or daughter of God? The wonderful thing that Christ has taken away from you. The things that he has set you free from already. The change that he is making in your life every day you're willing to allow him. I just find that so profound. Matthew 8, 17. He himself took our infirmities and carried away our diseases. Anything you have experienced or are going to experience or are experiencing, Christ has already taken them from you. Everything. There's nothing left that he cannot take. It has already been accomplished in your behalf. Isaiah 53, 6. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was born of a woman. He was a man. He knows you. He understands you. He's compassionate about saving you. That is awesome. That is so profound. Listen to how Wagner writes it in Glad Tidings. He redeemed us by coming into our place literally and by taking a load off our shoulders. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become 
the righteousness of God. You see, the righteousness of God is gifted to us. It is not a duty you perform. Have you received the gift of his righteousness? Freely, confidently, courageously. Verse 5, so that he might redeem those under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. See, in Isaiah 53, 1, it says, All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Why? So that he could gift you his life. His compliance, his meeting the full demands of the law and giving you eternal life. That's an amazing story, isn't it? Verse 6. Because you are the sons and daughters, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, the translators here, in almost every translation, take the word Abba, an Aramaic word, by the way, and they translate it formally as father. And, and I understand why they do that. I, I don't question that. But if you look up the word Abba in Aramaic, the word Abba is an endearing title. You would call that person dad. Let me read verse 6 to you again as it's actually written. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our cr hearts crying out, Dad! That's profoundly intimate. That is such a close, compassionate, that's a name saved only for your dad, for your father, your heavenly father. And how does that cry happen? It's because God puts the spirit of his son into your heart to cry out to dad. Beautiful, isn't it? Verse 7. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, Remember the child we talked about last week? You're no longer one of those children like a slave, but you are now a son and daughter. And if a son and daughter, then you're an heir through God. What does a son and daughter look like and sound like? If God has in his son written love to God and love to the neighbor on your heart, the new covenant, Psalms 40 says, I delight to do your will, O oh my God, your law, is within my heart. You see, the law is never done away with. It's a holy thing. It has a work to do, but when you accept Christ, he brings the fullness of love to God and love to your neighbor into your life that you may manifest that unconditional love to every human being you meet. In verse 8, it says, however, at that time, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those which by nature are no gods. You see, slaves have no control over their life. Previously, we lived by natural impulses. Now we live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. Verse 9. But know that you have come to know God, or rather to be known by God. How is it that you turn your back again to the weak and worthless elemental things which you desire to be enslaved again? Whoa, where did that come from? Because there is a corporate problem in the church of Galatians. Because there are those who are teaching people they need to go back and keep all the old laws and perform them to demonstrate they're saved. And Paul says, by going back, you're being enslaved by the elemental things. Those are the things that distract us from God. To which you desire to be enslaved all over again. Going back to living by our own abilities to obey enslaves us once again, in our previous life before Christ. Verse 10, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that perhaps I have labored over you in vain. You see, the new Gentile converts were being led back to ancient Jewish practices as evidence of their salvation in Christ. But that is no difference than a Christian saying, I have to obey the law to be saved. It's the same thing in Paul would write to you today and say, who bewitched you? That is not in Scripture. That is not the gospel. I beg of you, brothers and sisters, become as I am. 
for I also have become as you are. You have done me no wrong, but you know that it was because of bodily illness that I preached the gospel to you in the first time. <laughs> Hang on, you're going to find out what that means. And that, and that which was a trial to you in my bodily condition, you did not despise or loathe, but you received me as an angel or a messenger of God as Christ Jesus himself. Verse 15. Where then is that sense of blessing you had? In other words, they've lost something. You see, when you go back to perform in your strength the law of God, you have been deceived and you have lost a blessing. Because if you choose to live by the law, you must keep it perfectly. Notice the second part of verse 15. For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your eyes and given them to me. By the way, that's a hint to some of the ailments Paul is experiencing because his eyesight was failing him severely. And they were very kind to take him in and to work with him. Verse 16. So I've become your enemy by telling you the truth. How quickly do we turn on those who teach justification by faith alone? Self-justified, we become critics and judges. There is a problem in, in, in Christianity individually and sometimes corporately in congregations in which we become the critic and judge of everyone else because we reflect at how well we're doing on our own. And Paul says, so I've become your enemy by telling you the truth? In other words, they're attacking Paul. They're rejecting the gospel he brought them. And if you remember how we begin this conversation, Paul went before all of the apostles and presented the gospel, and it was affirmed by all of them. Paul was preaching present truth then, and it is present truth today. Verse 17, they eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. Everyone's an evangelist in the church. There's a strange power in turning others away from living by faith to doing human obedience. I have seen it over the years, 30 some years of ministry, and I wish to tell you this problem has not changed in the church. Because some people forget they're saved by faith and they turn to duty instead. Verse 18. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. Did you catch a moment here in the sadness of Paul? I want you to think about this. Here Paul comes. He presents the truth as it is in Jesus. Those people responded enthusiastically with every ounce of their being. And then, when I talk about the corporate experience, those in the congregation, I call them ultra-conservatives, who prized their obedience, inserted that theology alongside of the gospel. Today, in Christianity, we have the gospel of saved by faith alone, Right alongside of it, we have what Paul was writing about. God meets the goodness in me of my own obedience, all the goodness that already is in me, and therefore, he meets me part way. Or there's the gospel, the third one, that lays right alongside of it that says, I've accepted Christ, now I must obey the law. You see, those things haven't changed. All three are still alive in the church today. But last week we realized that that can be a doom or a curse. You understand how important this conversation is today? I cannot stress to you how vitally it is for you to understand that Christ has already met the demands of the law and he's written that law in your heart. And you are free to embrace that law 24-7 and demonstrate it by expressing love to your Father in heaven and to your neighbor freely. That's already present truth. But if you're trying to perform duty to show God how good you are, I'm sorry, but that takes you back to a curse. That's what Paul said, who bewitched you. Notice verse 19 of chapter 4 and verse 20. My children, 
with whom I am again in labor until Christ is formed in you. Verse 20. But I could wish to be present with you now and change my tone. For I am perplexed about you. It's a great place to end our conversation there. Why is Paul perplexed? Because he cannot fathom, he cannot understand why people would want to insert their duty into their salvation that comes by faith alone in Jesus Christ. He is perplexed. As you should be. As I should be. If, if there is freedom in Christ, if we are free to love, it's because when you accepted Christ, he brought love to the Father, the first four commandments, and love to your neighbor, the last six, into your life as he manifested them in the world so that you are free by impulse to express those same things to the world around you. The church has some room to grow in this area. I want to take you to an astounding picture from Yellowstone National Park. Here's one of Sherry's fre uh, precious friends. Uh, this big old guy was just standing there hanging out. Uh, I want you to know I'm really grateful for telephoto lenses because Sherry is not standing six feet away from this young guy. He's just standing there. Sherry is probably uh, about 50 yards away. But isn't he just gorgeous? What an animal. What a thing God has created. Something to run free on the grasslands of the prairie. God is so amazing. His son is so amazing. He has done everything you need to be saved. Will you say yes? Please say yes to him. It's the best news in the whole world. I hope you're blessed by this conversation in Galatians. You take care now. See you soon.